This video is an excerpt from a much longer Italy travel talk. To view other topics or to watch my Italy talk in its entirety, visit ricksteves.com or check out my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Enjoy. Buongiorno. Are you ready to go to Rome? Rome is brutal. Rome crushes ill-equipped and ill-prepared tourists. But if you know how to enjoy Rome, it is the most magnificent city. Rome, along with Paris and London and Istanbul, is one of four cities in Europe that really merits a one-week visit. And when you go to Rome, you're going to enjoy the, the father of our civilization, basically. It has got so much history. You need to see it in layers. You need to be prepared. You've got to anticipate the crowds and the heat. Let's talk about how we're going to enjoy Rome. Now, when you're thinking about Italy, there are three great cities, Venice, Florence, and Rome. This is our most popular itinerary. I would highly recommend considering open jaws in Italy and doing Rome as the finale. Rome is where you've got to warm up to it. Things are an anticlimactic after Rome, and I would fly home from Rome. That would make a lot of sense to me. Rome goes all the way back. It was, of course, a thousand years the center of the, uh, of the ancient world in the West, from a Western point of view. To put the story of Rome into a nice, easy kind of uh, uh, spectrum, you've got the birth of Rome 500 years before Christ. It lasts for a thousand years until 500 AD. It grows for 500 years. It peaks for 200 years, that's the Pax Romana, and then it falls for 300 years. There's a little more to the story than that, but that's Rome in a very tight nutshell. The first 500 years was the Republic, then it got so big they needed an emperor who could rule it with an iron fist, and that was the Empire period from the time of Christ on until it fell. You'll find the symbol of Rome, Romulus and Remus being suckled by the she-wolf all over town. You'll also find the great emperors being honored. Everywhere you go in Rome, you'll find history. It's hard to imagine a city 2,000 years ago with a million people in it, and that was ancient Rome, classical Rome. When Rome was at its peak, the word Rome meant the civilized world itself, much more than just the city. Here's the Roman Empire at its peak from the time of Christ for 200 years. And notice how Rome is absolutely the center of that realm. Notice how the lake was called Our Lake, Mare Nostrum. And notice that all of that green was the civilized world. People who spoke Latin or Greek and everything beyond that was the barbarian world, not quite human. Bar, bar, bar. <laughs> of course, it started to fall later on, but really when you think about the ancient world, this is really what you're thinking about. Now, when you talk about Rome itself, it's on the Tiber River, originally inhabited where the Etruscan civilization to the north met the Greek civilization to the south. Southern Italy was a Greek colony called Magna Graecia. It was as far up the river as you could go by boat and the first place you could cross with a bridge, Rome. And when we look at the Tiber, we can see the different neighborhoods of Rome, and it's remarkably walkable when you're downtown in the center. You need to think of Rome in neighborhoods. You can connect things very quick and easy by taxi. You can go across the river when you want to see Trastevere in the Vatican, but most of it is in that medieval and ancient core. Of course, the ancient sites of Rome are really what most of us have in mind. You've got the Colosseum, built 2,000 years ago to house 50,000 people with numbered seats. They could fill it and empty it as quickly and efficiently as we do our great stadiums. I want to remind you there's huge crowds. And you're going where everybody wants to go. There's four or five sites that everybody wants to see in the city that everybody wants to see. And if you're going to those four or five sites, you better have a reservation or a pass that lets you pass the, the lines. There are plenty of ways to get around the lines, but without taking advantage of that in advance, you're going to be at the end of this line really getting a sunburn and wasting a lot of precious time. Once you get inside, you need history, you need guiding, you need information to help you bring resurrect that rubble. Otherwise, it's hard to appreciate what it's all about. But with the help of a good guide, it does make sense. I just love the challenge as a guide to sit my tourist down on the rubble of ancient Rome and bring it to life. And that's what our guides do. Anywhere in Europe, we love to bring the story to life. We've got some very good guides in Rome. It's a city that deserves guides, and it's a city that has a lot of wonderful licensed guides. And there's a lot of tour companies that will let you not have to hire a private guide, but book onto a tour and have a local licensed guide show you around, and that would make a lot of sense. We've also got my app, Rick Steves Audio Europe, that has very important 
guided tours to the great sites of ancient Rome and the great sites of the Vatican. This app will be a godsend for you if you don't have the luxury of your own private guide. Take advantage of that if you want to have that service. When you're thinking of the Roman Forum, this is the common grounds between the seven hills of ancient Rome. That's where the magic of Rome happened. And then, right from the start, 500 years before Christ, war was the business of state. Rome starts expanding, and bigger and bigger and bigger, and this becomes the hub, the capital of a vast empire. And this was the main drag of the capital of that empire, the Via Sacra. And today, when you sightsee, you walk down this Via Sacra, and you try to resurrect all that rubble and understand what it was like so long ago when they had their triumphal parades going down this under the triumphal arches and so on. And it's just, it covers you with goosebumps when you can get a guide that can help you bring it to life. Lots of propaganda. Art back then was art to make the people follow the emperor, to fall in line. When you're looking at Rome, it's hard to grasp the immensity of their buildings and the power of the empire. I mean, look at this. And then you realize if you get an artist's reconstruction of it, those are just the side niches. And you see the little broken nub on the top? That would be the part of an arch that went all the way across. And this is as big as a vacant, uh, an empty football field today, but it was all just veneered with fine marble and all sorts of elegant people and togas and fountains and so on. It is hard to imagine the magnificence of Rome at its zenith. And to this day, there are ancient doors that are still swinging on their original hinges from 2,000 years. Now, the Capitol Hill is the hill that overlooks the Roman Forum. And on the Capitol Hill, you've got two of the most important museums in Rome, the, the Capitoline Museums. And you can step into those museums, and it's easy to be overwhelmed by the outdoor magnificence of Rome, but remember, the beautiful, beautiful statues, and there's lots of that, are taken out of the acidic air and put inside so you can enjoy it there. Make a point to save time and energy for those interior sites. And the Capitoline Museum is one where you will find a lot of the textbook examples of Roman art right there. Not very crowded, very easy to enjoy, and a lot of antiquities. A short walk away is the Pantheon. And the Pantheon is the building that gives you a feeling and an appreciation for the magnificence and the splendor of Rome at its zenith better than any other building. When you step inside of the Pantheon, you realize how beautifully preserved it is. And you got to recognize it's the one building that wasn't really cannibalized because it went almost directly from being a temple to all the gods, Pantheon, to a church dedicated to the martyrs of Rome, or the people who were killed by, during Rome for their Christian faith. And when you step into the, into the Pantheon and you look up, at this incredible dome, and you think of the technology they had way back then in the year 200, how on earth did they build this thing? Exactly as wide as it is tall, 140 feet. It was the biggest dome in Europe for 1,400 years. They poured the concrete so it got more porous and less heavy as it got to the top where it didn't need to be so strong. And then you got this beautiful, beautiful skylight in the center. This is free. It's right there in the center of Rome. You can pop in any time you like. This is the Victor Emmanuel monument here, and it's a, it's, a, it's a big, overbuilt kind of monstrosity built to the ego of the king just 110 years ago or something like that. But uh, I like the Victor Emmanuel monument because it gives you a feeling for the pomposity and the, and the grandiosity of Rome. And if you put a thousand of those buildings together, in my mind, that would be what ancient Rome was like. Now, the cool thing about the Victor Emmanuel Monument, the bad thing is it's sitting on a bunch of antiquities and they can't get at it because there's big buildings there. The great thing about it is you can go to the top of that building, if you know about the elevator on the back side, and you can enjoy a beautiful view from up there. It's a cool view because you can look down on the Forum, you got the best 360 look at the city, and you don't have to look at the building you're standing on. <laughs> Imagine this view from the top of the Victor Emmanuel Monument. I love it. I really love it. One of my favorite buildings in all of Europe is the Gallery Borghese because of what's inside of it. The greatest statues by the wonderful Bernini. Bernini was the father of the Baroque movement. Now, you have to get a reservation to get into the Gallery Borghese. They only let in a couple hundred people every hour or something like that. But it's easy to get a reservation. You go inside and you've got Apollo chasing Daphne and you've got a handful of other amazing masterpieces by Bernini and by Canova.
I want to remind you, if you know where to go in Rome, Florence and Milan, you can see almost all of Michelangelo's great works of art. And when you're in Rome, you've got a chance to see Moses in the church, St. Peter's in Chain. And this is an important just tactical or you know, advice about your sightseeing in Rome. It's a big, grueling city. You spend a lot of time in traffic and a lot of money in taxis. You might as well see things neighborhood at a time. And if you're going to go to the Colosseum, which you're going to do, you should know that a five minute walk away from the Colosseum is the St. Peter and Chains Church, which has a Michelangelo statue of Moses. It's free, it's not crowded, and it's open an hour before the Colosseum. If you're stretching your day, here's an example of being a smart tour guide. Get an early start. Go enjoy St. Peter's and Chains and Michelangelo's Moses at the crack of the day, at the beginning of the day, and then have a cup of coffee, walk down, and be the first person into the Colosseum. You can do that if you plan smartly, and that's important. Also, in Rome, like any city, you've got all sorts of quirky sites you might not know about if you didn't do your studying. A lot of people are fascinated by human bones. If you like human bones, you got them in Rome, man. You got them in Rome. Now, you don't go out to the, ca the catacombs to see human bones. No bones in the catacombs. Fascinating sights, but no bones. If you want bones, you go to the Capuchin crypt. The Capuchin monks had an interesting habit of hanging their dead brothers up to dry down in the crypt. When all the flesh was rotted away, they would go down and decorate with the remaining bones. A hundred years later, they charged tourists to see it. <laughs> with a funny little slogan on the roof as you enter, Visitors, be mindful. They were as you are today, and you will soon be as they are today. All right, so it's just a cheery little reminder about your mortality halfway through your vacation. Rome is crowded with lots of tourists, with lots of locals, and lots of thieves. Thieves target tourists, and I would say in all of Europe, the place you're most likely to get pickpocketed would be Barcelona and Rome, okay? You're not going to get mugged. There's no violent risk. It's, if you're using common sense, there's just the obvious risk of pickpocketing and purse snatching. And if you're a thief in Rome, you go on to bus 69. That is the major bus that goes from the train station to the Vatican through the heart of the city, packed with tourists and pickpockets. You can see them working on that bus. Be on the ball. Wear your money belt and understand that there are people eyeballing you. Tourists are targeted. It's really fun to go to the Jewish ghetto. One of the early ghettos is in Rome. In fact, the Jewish community in Rome is the oldest Jewish community in Europe. That was before the diaspora, before the destruction of the temple. There was a Jewish community of merchants there before Christ. And they've been in this little part of Rome for over 2,000 years. To this day, Jewish families whose lineage goes back 2,000 years gather together on their folding chairs and just make the scene. And you can join them in the ghetto. Across the river from the ghetto, you've got Trastevere. Remember, when you go across the river, you get to the rough side of the tracks, kind of, in European terms. And there is Trastevere across the river. That's where your crusty poetry can be written. And then also on the other side of the river, you've got the Vatican Museum. People would bury their dead outside of the city walls, and St. Peter was buried in a little humble graveyard on Vatican Hill. Tras Tavery, literally across the Tiber River, is a fascinating place to wander and check out. And then, just to beyond that, you've got, of course, St. Peter's. Remember, there was a chariot race course here before there was a Roman Catholic church. And for halftime entertainment, they would kill Christians, and St. Peter was one of these who was martyred there. And after the chariot race course, this obelisk you see was a decoration point on that chariot race course. St. Peter would have seen this obelisk on the day he was killed. His followers took his body to a little hill nearby and buried him there on the Vatican Hill. And for 300 years or 200 years, Christians would worship quietly after dark, low profile because it wasn't okay. And then in 312, the Emperor Constantine became a Christian, or, and Christianity became the legal religion of the empire. By 390, it was the only permissible religion, and you've got yourself a huge church built on the tomb of St. Peter's. St. Peter was the first pope, and from him we have all the popes to this day. And this is the center of a billion Catholic Christians, and it's a beautiful place to check out. The cathedral itself is an amazing place. If you're going to Europe in Christmas time, Rome is a great place to be. This is the squared Christmas with the giant manger scene. And when I look at that 
dome right there, I'm looking at the dome that Michelangelo designed, taller than a football field on end. You can go to the very top. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Getting back to Christmas, in Rome, Christmas lasts until Epiphany, January 6th, the twelfth day of Christmas, when Jesus got the gifts from the three wise men. And you've got a big celebration on that day, and lots of celebrations before that, and Rome is really festive during Christmas. It's a fun time to be there. When you see a guy with a bushy beard and a key, that is Saint Peter, and you see him all over the place around the Vatican. When you step into that glorious basilica, you look to the inside of the dome, and you see writing in letters as tall as me, each one of those six feet tall, and it says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. See, that's the, the reason for the importance of that church in Christendom. You step into the church, and you're just wonderstruck. One of my great treats as a guide is to take my groups into that church. I go in first and watch people as they step inside. It's an incredible space. For years, I went to St. Peter's Basilica as a, as a Lutheran with an attitude, and it was a horrible experience. I didn't enjoy it. Park your Protestant sword, if you have one, at the door. Become a Catholic, at least temporarily, when you go to St. Peter's Basilica. See it on its terms. Celebrate it. It's an amazing place. If you like to go to church any day of the year, you can go to church at 5 o'clock right there on the tomb of St. Peter's and actually experience that church doing what it was designed to do, to facilitate worship. It's an amazing, amazing experience. Of course, in the church you've got some great art. You've got Michelangelo's Pieta. And this is one of the great art treasures of Europe. And just to see that right there where it was supposed to be is just so great. You can climb to the top of the dome. When Michelangelo built his dome, remember here, he said, oh, I can build a dome bigger, but not more beautiful than my dome in Florence. But this was the biggest dome to be built in Europe. That's really quite an inspiration. And you can go to the very top, and from the top you can get a view of that little country called the Vatican. You can get a view of the great square and that obelisk, and you can look off into the city of Rome, and you can look down on the Sistine Chapel from the top of that dome. That rectangular building is the Sistine Chapel, and if you want to go to the Sistine Chapel, you've got to walk through what I think must be the biggest museum around, the Vatican Museum, and the, co the highlight, the finale, the culmination of that museum experience is the Sistine Chapel. The Vatican Museum itself is amazing. It's very, very crowded, and it's going to be crowded when you're there. There's no way around the crowds. It's just a mob scene all day long. I think it's worth it. Most tourists stick to the main Rompel route, you know, but you can verge off of that and have a lot of peace and quiet if you like. But it's just an amazing thing. You got the art treasures of Western civilization, the Leakawan, you got Apollo Belvedere, you got lots of beautiful rooms, all designed and frescoed by, by Raphael. And when you get to those rooms, you're going to have a human traffic jam. It's going to be this crowded. And you're just going to shuffle through with all the mobs, everybody with their cameras up and videoing the thing, you know. And it's just, you can get a bad attitude about it, but I'll warn you right now, gird yourself for the crowd and just look above the masses of sweaty people and enjoy the wonder of art 500 years ago that brought Europe, helped bring Europe into our modern age. The finale. The reward for all those crowds is the Sistine Chapel. And on the ceiling, you've got the whole story of creation, designed by Michael, painted by Michelangelo, frescoed by Michelangelo, God giving Adam the spark of life. And then much later on, the Pope asked Michelangelo to come back down and paint the Last Judgment above the altar. A whole different part of art history. The, uh, the, first, the ceiling was High Renaissance. This is Counter-Reformation. Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation has torn Europe in half. There's all sorts of wars everywhere. The Catholic army of Spain has actually plundered Rome, sacked Rome, and the church is reeling. And the church is coming out swinging with their counter-reformation art. And here we have Jesus coming down on Judgment Day. His fist is raised. Mary is cowering at his side. He used to be able to go to Mary for some help, but she's saying, I can't do anything right now. He's really, really intense right now. And there's people, people are going to hell and people are going to heaven according to how they followed the dictates of the church. Counter-Reformation art. Understand who pays for the art and why. What's the context? All across Europe, your sightseeing experience becomes much better. There are different overlays of your Roman experience. You can do ancient Rome, you can do Baroque Rome, you can do Catholic Rome, you can do fascist Rome, you can do today's shoppers Rome and antique Rome. You can also do pilgrims Rome. And a lot of us neglect 
that whole fascinating slice of Rome. But a lot of people come to Rome on a pilgrim's agenda, not on a tourist's agenda. You can climb the holy steps, the Scala Santa, as people have been doing for centuries. These are the steps to Pontius Pilate's mansion, brought back to Rome from the Holy Land by Constantine's mother in the fourth century. And ever since then, pilgrims have come to Rome, said the Lord's Prayer on each step as they climb it on their knees, hoping to get less time off in purgatory. A lot of Italians don't go to church a lot, but if they ever have a near miss on their motorcycle, they'll go right down to church and hang their helmet up right there on this chapel where you've got the saint that you thank when you have a near-death experience on your motorcycle. You know, the Catholicism is really in the DNA of Catholics, and you find that when you go to the churches. I mentioned uh, fascist Italy. Mussolini had a chance to really, really uh, pump it up during uh, his, his, his reign and build a lot of impressive buildings. And you can go out to a futuristic planned city called EUR when you're in Rome. EUR is a chance to see what society would be like if it gave the reins to a fascist dictator. It's no questions asked. It's either you're with us or against us. It's violent, neo-pagan, super-duper patriotism. It's all of everybody in lockstep. It's really a s chilling kind of thing. And you really see it at EUR. You really see it. I find it quite powerful. Outside of Rome, just half an hour, is the ancient port of Rome called Ostia Antica. Now, if you don't have time to go to Pompeii, which is the ultimate ancient site, three hours south of Rome, go to Pompeii, or go to Ostia. It's just half an hour away, and it rivals Pompeii. It's amazing, Ostia Antica. At night, the floodlight come on, people come out, the police close down the main drag, and everybody is out making the scene strolling. In Italy, of course, that's the passeggiata. In Rome, it's a little coarser. It's called the struccio. That's the great rubbing. Everybody's out rubbing. And you're saying bello or bella, make sure you get your gender right. And people are sizing everybody up. It's a, sort of a meat market out in the streets. It's multi-generational, everybody's out checking out the scene, cruising up and down the Via del Corso. I find it fascinating, it's one of the great sights of Rome, is just to be out in the evening strolling the Via del Corso. Or sit down in a nice corner, pay too much for a cup of coffee or a drink, and, and watch the whole scene in front of you. It's a beautiful thing to do in Rome. All over Italy, you got that great coffee culture, and you can certainly enjoy that. I love to lace together the great night spots in Rome, and when I do that, I find that I can go from the Campo di Fiori to the Piazza Navona with its wonderful fountains, you can drop by the Spanish Steps, and you can go to the Trevi Fountain. And the Trevi Fountain is one of the romantic sites of romantic Europe, where people from all over the world gather to throw a coin over their shoulders to guarantee that they'll return to the great city of Rome, the eternal city of Rome. You know, I throw a coin over my shoulder and it, uh, it works. You go back every year if you want to. But I think if you're on a tight budget, you don't really need to do that. Rome is a brutal city. Rome is in so many ways the capital, the father of our civilization. And if you prepare well for Rome, it's also a very enjoyable experience. I hope you enjoy Rome. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this video, you'll find lots more at ricksteves.com and on my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Happy travels and thanks for joining us.